So I hope to be able to speak to enough on this topic. Real quick, not all of you guys might be familiar with the Microsoft platform, uh, the AI platform, so I just wanted to give a super high on you. Intent is not to try to sell you guys on anything here, so I'll keep it light. If you're interested in buying it, come talk to me afterwards. <laughs> but real quick, the philosophy really is to apply these types of capabilities, and in general, AI capabilities, across the entire stack of platform tools, right? We know that Microsoft has traditionally done very well in some of the citizen development or the self-service oriented tools with strong GUI layers, strong kind of intuitive, visually driven development layers. That's kind of represented at the top, what we call the application platform there, and the AI tools, especially with open AI, are being added and integrated I have a couple demos or pre recorded demos that should show you some of the capabilities around it. But it's looking really cool. We're starting to see even the ability to generate workflows or data flows, even just using a natural language prompt, right? And it strings together basically the code that it generates with the intent and the input of the source and the sync that you're trying to deal with and be able to output like a pre constructed workflow that you need to be able to. So that's, I think, where a lot of investment and enablement and deployment of the technology is going to happen in the Microsoft world. As we get further down, I think this is where we get deeper and deeper into like the pure data science side of the platform. Um, the scenario-based services are basically pre-built scenario-based AIs like tracking the document, or doing translation, and then you have customizable models that are like generic models that you can to or train with your data. And then finally, the machine learning platform at the very, very bottom, which is just notebook based or drag and drop based or auto ML based type of data science. Today, what we're looking at is a subset of this whole thing, which is part of this cognitive service layer. These are the pre trained general models that can then be customized on your data or leverage against your data. And what I mean by uh, General models, as you can see, like they roughly address a particular category of problem, like speech to text or speech understanding or language understanding or vision, or vision that type of stuff. Okay, so a little bit about the history of large language models. Um, I thought this was really interesting, just doing some research and background on the technology. What was really cool to me is it just isn't that old. We're talking like five years ago when we had our first, um, uh, not GPT model, but a natural language model uh, that was a transformer based. That was the first language model. And I think the measure of how large a model is is really based off of like the number of parameters that are used to train that model. So the bird model in 2018 was about 340 million. Uh, parameters. Then we move up to the Turing model, which is about 17 billion. OpenAI, this is GPT-3, this was about two, three years ago, 2020, was about 175 billion. And then more recently, this is 2021, Microsoft and NVIDIA partnered together, Microsoft Research, rather, a subdivision of Microsoft, which works with academics and universities, um, put together a, a, a model called Megatron Turing, creative naming Microsoft, as always, um, with 530 billion parameters. Now, the interesting thing is that you guys have been following the news with GPT-4 and the release of GPT-4, OpenAI CEO has said it's not being trained on very much more parameters than GPT-3. It's actually going to be significantly smaller than the Megatron Turing 530 million parameters. And what we started to see is really larger doesn't necessarily mean better. Right? Larger in many cases can mean um, it's more likely to hallucinate or come up with inaccurate responses. And so part of what they're looking at is changing the way that the model is actually trained, isolating specific data, using hyperparameterization techniques to help the model improve as opposed to just throwing more and more data points at it and trying to get it to improve. 
So I thought that was pretty interesting, and we're starting to see a subset of models emerge as well that are performing better than this 530 billion uh, parameter model uh, using much less data points. So the partnership between Microsoft and OpenAI, I think, is one that was widely publicized with a $10 billion investment that Microsoft made in earlier this year to, into OpenAI. Um, just a little bit of detail if you're curious about what the extent of that partnership is. There's really two parts to it that are really important. Number one is we are the cloud infrastructure, the cloud computing um, infrastructure that all OpenAI models are run on, hosted, and trained on. We're the sole provider for that. So that's pretty cool. And then the second thing is also Microsoft has access directly to those models as soon as they're done to be able to leverage them and put them into our platform. To be able to be the first to market essentially to provide these capabilities in a secure, enterprise, reliable, or present system manner for a company to be able to enjoy. This will matter a lot more when we get into that responsible AI side of things because. The number one conversation I have all the time is about security. Is my data going to get leaked? Is this thing going to be putting my information all over the internet? Is Microsoft going to use this and retrain and fine tune their models? So, security becomes the number one question that any CISO or any kind of security organization uh, raises as an objection to implementing these models. Really quickly, diving into the uh, kind of open AI service itself. So remember, this is a subset of services within those kind of generic, customizable services or models that you're able to leverage. Um, today, you're looking at these two primarily inside of the open AI service. These are all based off of open AI's models that they research, develop, and kind of put out there. So the latest we added in, couple months ago was GPT-4, a couple weeks after its release. GP chat GPT, of course, um, when it first came out, that was available also in chat GPT. So GPT-3.5 is another name for it. And then DALI, the uh, image generating model, so being the same, like painting a picture or drawing a picture, made a yarn, um, that is a plane flying from the sky, and it's able to generate uh, so just a quick example of what they each look like. GPT models is really about prompt response. So you give it a prompt, you ask it to get some sort of instruction for what you'd like to do with that prompt, whether it's answer a question, uh, come up with something that you've generated, like please generate a new uh, clever name for my, I don't know, my, my new pet or something like that, my child. Um, so it's a generation and then kind of response. Dali, in the picture, and then chat GPT was a little bit different here. It is really the context that it can keep in a more kind of chat-like manner, and also the way that it understands uh, information. It's less instructional, less terse, and more conversational in how it understands language. So I'm going to go through in the next section, I'm going to basically cover GPT-3, Chat GPT, how it's different, and then GPT 4. I'll give you guys a little bit of an example of the evolution of security types of models. Right? So, GPT 3 being kind of the first one to make it out there in 2020 and really make a splash at the time. Um, GPT 3 is this kind of pure, uh, auto aggressive, you know, trained on historical data. Remember, 170 billion, uh, 75 billion uh, parameters. It takes that model understands kind of how a human articulates information, how a human communicates information, and then is able to take prompts from a user and be able to return a prompt back out in a human-like manner, in a communicative-like manner. It's a kind of text-in, text-out type of solution. Uh, we call this like a single-shot type solution. So you give a single prompt, it gives you a single response back, and every time you query that engine, it is a single prompt in, a single response back out. It has no understanding of any previous interactions or previous engagements that you've had. So it's a fresh 
analysis or fresh generation every time you access a prompt in this particular engine. So it's a powerful language model, of course, quite simple and uh, built in kind of like a deep learning uh, manner. Here's an example of how the prompts would look. Let's say you had an email, you give it some sort of instruction, please extract the email address or the mailing address out of this particular line, and then it's able to read through this, understand what you're asking for, and give you a single response back out. ChatGPT, or GPT 3.5, how it differentiates is it takes that GPT-3 model, the ability to synthesize and understand language, and then it adds the ability to interpret and respond back out in a conversational manner, and it also includes the ability for you to say, how many prior inputs do I need to keep the context of in order to have this dialogue with this individual, right? And that's where the chat naming part of it comes from. So really what it's telling us it's able to do is now not only does it expect and interpret the prompts a little bit differently, because remember the input is more of a dialogue than an instruction, it's able to respond in a way that is more like a dialogue or human communication or human response, but it's also able to keep the context of the conversation back to an end number of prior inputs. And that actually becomes really useful for us going forward because it helps us to address issues like hallucinations or inaccurate responses. So this actual context keeping is a tool for how we going forward use things like prompt engineering to be able to get an accurate response or ensure that we get an accurate response. So to sum it up, it's conversational, it's multi-term, you can follow the response, and it can create the same as GPT-3, some sort of a, a creative or interesting output. Some of the limitations with chat GPT, and these are the big ones I think where you see like the writers of the New York Times or the Atlantic or something like that come back and say like they've had experiences where the model is telling them really strange things and telling them that it was going to, I don't know, make, take a hit out on them or something like that or it can shut itself down. Um, and that is through when people are trying to hack the, uh, I forget the exact terminology, but when people are trying to hack the GPT engine and try to get it to respond or behave in a weird way because it has that ability to change the context so they can try and um, steer it in a direction that gives straight responses back to So this is one of the major limitations and continues to be a major limitation, the hallucinations, right? And you'll often see examples where it'll give completely wrong answers if you just try and give like a really complex task to it in a single shot. And then um, what you want to do is break that task down as a way to try and get a, a better answer or more mental answer or more accurate answer back down. There's also another limitation which is with chat you can custom tune these models, which you'll see the capability introduced in GPT 4. So um, this is where we come to GPT-4, the, the latest, the newest, the best performing thing. I think where a lot of the excitement and uh, uh, wonder has emerged around this technology, right? So GPT-4 is a multi-model, or multi, multi modal model. Um, it accepts text inputs, image inputs, and it can feed back out text outputs. Um, there are many cases where it's still not the same as human parity, but there's also many cases where it can do a pretty good job of uh, mimicking certain human responses or getting pretty close to human parity. It's more reliable, I think this is one of the key things, it's more reliable than GPT-3 and GPT-3.5. Um, they reduce, I think, the amount of inaccuracies by like 40% when they provide the statistic around that, so it's actually pretty important. Um, some of the things that it can do as well that are really key here, visual questioning and answering, so you can give it like a visual piece of information, and you can say, 
please analyze this, like read a graph or interpret a photo or read a meme or something like that. That's pretty important and pretty impressive. Or it can even do the reverse, right? You can ask it to generate something that's an image of that as a result of that. Um, steerability is super important as well. So one of the things that you've seen in the GPT board that you can do before is you can have ChatGPT take off personas. So you can give it instructions to say, I would like you to take the persona of a operator. And then that persona, please respond to my questions in that persona. But please take the persona of a customer. Please respond to my thoughts in that persona. So it's actually able to take on personas and disability. It's also able to um, answer much more effectively through prompt engineering. So you can force it to take a slower, more methodical approach to answering a question that can lead to a more accurate result as a result of this. So this is actually a pretty big improvement. And then finally, if anybody's been paying attention to how you consume this, um, it runs based off the token system. So a thousand tokens roughly comes out to about a page and a half of content, or 800 words of content. Um, and that's a cap in the past, in the prior GPT models. So being able to digest, read, synthesize, and then serve out longer responses is a big part of uh, what GPT-4 can do too. So you can see it's increased by several magnitudes. And this is really key, because if you think about how you would actually take a body of knowledge that an entire organization has put together, let's say all of the training documentation around how to do it, your job. That could be well more than a page and a half, right? So as opposed to feeding GPT a page and a half information at a time and trying to assemble the answer back out, you can feed it a lot more at the same time for it to summarize. So what does GPT input look like? You have the image input, it interprets the image. You have the text input, it interprets what you want out of the text. And there's a combination layer where it comes together the image input and the text input. There are some of the headlines, and I think the splashes um, that GPT-4 has been making over the last year. Uh, I thought this was cool. I thought about taking this one out, but it was too quick to pass up. If you take a look at the blue bars there, that's the accuracy that GPT-3.5 or ChatGPT was able to achieve. And then GPT-4 is the green bars above that, right? And so some of the biggest headlines that you would have seen is the performance on the bar exam, as well as the performance on the US uh, medical exam as well. So uh, I think if you look down below here, it's like beating out SAP scores, GRE scores, all for like university entrance, LSAT scores, as well as it's taken a ton of the AP course exams. Also, we've done a really good job uh, beating those out. So this is this is a pretty good, I think, testament to the capability or the knowledge that it can in terms of uh, human-like behavior, human-like response. Let's give you guys a couple examples. Here's one where you take a, a picture of a fridge and you hand it over to GPT and you ask it for like, how do you make a or make a meal out of this? So tell me what the ingredients, just by taking a picture of the fridge, what, what dishes can I come up with? And it can come up with um, a few different examples of dishes, right? So this is a, an image and a text, and then it comes up with a response. For it. This one I'm super excited about. Um, I know my, my peers, even on a technical team, are incredibly excited about, but uh, we saw a demo where you're able to take a snapshot uh, a hand drawn back of the napkin or whiteboard sketch of a web page layout and then tell it to code that web page for you. And so it's actually able to interpret that, turn it into the code, and if you run the code, um, it'll actually give you a website as an output. So this is this is I think a forward look at just how dramatic this is going to change our industry developer in this sort of way, if you're a coder in any sort of a way, this is going to be a massive productivity tool for you. And um, getting ahead and learning about what the capabilities of what it can do for you is going to be um, a 
big game changer as well. It's going to make all of us a lot more productive and a lot more attractive as um, workers in space, as practitioners in the space. Let me give you guys a I wanted to give you guys an example, like an architecture example of how you can take kind of the different capabilities, GPT-4, GPT-3, string them together to create some sort of an output or some sort of a useful response. So in this situation, you can see you can take a, a body of text. Remember, I gave the example of like training documentation, or maybe this is invoices, or maybe this is kind of safety certifications. Um, so you take a body of text or documentation, you can put images in there like uh, you know, an annual report, or uh, if you take a PowerPoint presentation that has like the company's performance, or like some of the, the dashboard visualizations that we might produce as analysts, as data scientists, feed those in. We use GPT-3 to be able to interpret the text, we use GPT-4 to interpret the images, and then we store, this is actually a step in the middle here, I'll talk a little bit more about using this, but we store it in a format that the computer can understand, or in other words, embed it, right? So we can take the textual information, or we can take the image information, and when we convert it into a numeric format that is called an embedding, and that embedding can be stored so that when you create an answer, or when you try to retrieve the answer, when you prompt, solution, it's able to quickly access and understand what you're asking and come up with. So then it can give like a, a response back out and, and pick out kind of a image that should go with this particular response. I'll show you guys like a, another example that's actually deployed to in a little bit if I have some time. So some of the limitations of GPT-4, right, we've got to be careful. It's still not 100% reliable. Right? There's still the ability for it to hallucinate, to come up with incorrect answers. This is really key. It still makes reasoning errors. Right? So we still need to be able to help it to get to an accurate response or help it get to an accurate answer. It's still biased in its outputs. So if you think about it, the output of a predictive model is only as good as the data that you put into it. You put into it, but that data is biased. Outputs are still going to be biased. It's just going to be biased in a much more automatic or systematic way. Um, and then, as of all of the GPT models as well, they're trained up to 2021 data. So don't expect that we know like the latest scores on a population or who, the, I don't know, something current events and current. This is a current present, but um, we wouldn't know after this year. And then it also does not learn from its experience as well. I think this is one of the key things that I wanted to make sure that we we're all super clear on, is these models don't keep track of pre or prior conversations that it's had with people, even if it's deployed in your organization or on your data. It doesn't learn from kind of like the continuous interaction it has with people in your company or your customers. Every interaction with it remains a single, unique interaction with it. So each time it is seen the data for the first time, it is constructed its response for the very first time. That's the kind of way that the model works. So that's why you can get inconsistencies. That's why you can get hallucinations uh, between different thoughts or between different uh, triggers. Microsoft's application of this technology, right? So being the, or having the ability, being the, one of the largest investors in this platform, we have the opportunity to be able to build it into our platform and build it into our tooling um, first, before anybody else can. And I can tell you, it is going into absolutely everything. We have our big tech conference at the end of this month, the 23rd and 24th. You're probably going to expect to hear a lot of capabilities announced around how we integrate open AI and GPT technologies into everything from Outlook to Office to Word to PowerPoint. Um, and it'll help automate a lot of functionality. 
right? I have coworkers who are already using our we call it like dog food editions of things, where it's like a beta mode where they pull it up to employees. Um, so some of my coworkers are using this for emails. They say like I write seventy percent of my emails with this, and I just tune the last thirty. And it's pretty cool in how much time back you can actually get. I think one of the most interesting things that I've read recently about this is how excited everybody is for OpenAI, the GPT technologies to be able to help us address burnout and work overload. And nobody's actually that worried about getting the jobs on the way. They're more interested in like, am I going to get a four day work week because now I'm that much more efficient. So I think that's pretty cool. So I had to pick and choose a few to show because there's a lot. Um, here's the, the overall announcements to date, if anyone's interested in going through and picking through it. All of the announcements and blogs or videos and short demos um, you can find on um, various different posts. So if you wanted to go through and take a look at a particular section that is interesting to you or interesting to the work that you do, uh, check it out here. And also a timeline, right? basically, of where it's going to put it. So it started well, so we expect to see a lot more of this all across the board. One of the most impactful areas that I see that I'm super excited about is the integration with GitHub. So GitHub Copilot, we actually had a, a community meetup two weeks ago where my peer covers applications and application development, went into depth to the demo of GitHub Copilot. I was showing how this can basically help you to refine your code, add comments to your code. It can help you to generate blocks of code, right? I don't know about you guys, but most of the time when I was coding, um, I go to Stack Overload and I just copy the first answer and drop it into whatever I was doing, right? So this is a little bit better than that because it can also um, it will give you kind of clean code that it's generating based off of like a corpus or a, a prior body. What we're seeing, I think this should be quite interesting coming up as well, is latest I heard is you're going to be able to start querying your own um, Git repos or code repositories in your own internal organization. So I'm curious to see if that will lead to some sort of an integration here. I don't know, but I'm, I'm curious to see it. Capabilities around natural language to code, right? Um, generating, of course, SQL, or Python, or R, or any of these other kind of common coding languages. Microsoft uses for its tabular modeling or a form of their data modeling, uh, DAX data analysis expression. So, one of the first things that we're doing, of course, is building a natural language to calculate. So now you can just tell Power BI, which is a visualization tool, what type of a calculation you're trying to come up with. It will generate the code for you, and then the code can be converted into a model or into a, a measure or a visualization for you. There's even more sweeping changes that will come to this as well, right? So expect automation to start affecting every part of the platform when it comes to data. Um, I wanted to play a video just to give you guys an example of this integrated into Teams, if anyone uses Teams for work. You can start by asking Codepilot to summarize all your recent customer interactions, meetings, content you share, any issues, and deliveries. Codepilot works across your panel, emails, chats, Documents and meetings to find all the pertinent information. Now you've got a concise summary, complete with citations and sources. You can hold over the names, quotes, and finally to verify information or find out more. Now you know how many times the right ones come up, so you ask the right to help you prepare all the details. The 
the kind that synthesizes everything you need so you can feel perfect. Okay, so I picked one video out of many because I didn't want to just bombard you guys with commercials. But um, basically, this will be similar if you kind of think about it in your emails, right? Or it'll be similar in the way that you do uh, meetings and the transcriptions and the location of meetings as well. So the ability to kind of access a body of knowledge internally to the organization, the ability to summarize. Kind of speech or textual information and then turn it into relevant summarized points for you to review or to take a look at is all part of the capability of being built out across the platform. Um, why do I talk about this? I'm not just trying to say, like, hey, look at all this cool stuff that Microsoft is doing, but rather I chose specifically to include these examples because one of the conversations that we have over and over again with organization and customers looking at this is they're not sure how to apply this technology. Right? They're not sure how to build this into their own applications or their own use cases of the game. This is Microsoft saying how do we enhance our products? How do we enhance the thing that we do with this general technology? This is how we see the application, right? So using it to access information, using it to help create productivity or efficiency to summarize key pieces of information to help you respond to emails more quickly or to, to be able to monitor a team's meeting if you're not able to attend it when it's not booked. Right? So the capability or the possibility of building this out in a specific solution, a specific problem in mind for uh, the organizations that you work with are also in exercising creativity and uh, possibility that we all have. I didn't come up with these, obviously, but um, somebody sat down and said, how can this apply to a particular offering that we have, a particular product that we build, and then they turned it into a reality, right? It didn't exist on day one, it was something that somebody had to come up with. I'm going to show you guys a couple uh, demos if you're interested on this. Um, do you guys want to see me kind of real and show the product a little bit? I had a couple of solutions I wanted to show uh, today that I thought would be the most interesting and right to the point. Um, you have to forgive me if we get a product saying it's really busy because um, Microsoft doesn't make a lot of money. Give us resources to play with and do demos. It's a title. Um, this is an example of uh, the Open AI claim. So, the Open AI, yeah. Oh, thank So this is uh, when you create the OpenAI service. So remember the GPT and ChatGPT models are APIs. So meaning you can embed a call in a notebook, in a function, or something like that. Um, what we built as well, just for you to do some quick kind of testing and exploration, is something called the OpenAI Playground. Playground is just a GUI in front of the APIs that allows you to pick kind of the one you want to mess around with, or pick the one you want to Spin and see what the capabilities are. So, let me show you some of the, the, the abilities in here. So, I'll start with chat. I think this is the one that a lot of people have um, gone to openai.com and you want to chat the tool so you can kind of create this chat capability, right? So, um, the chat capability uses GPT 3.5, if you remember. You have a variety of different kind of tuning options on the left that can be managed via APIs or an SDK of the OpenAI service. Um, some of the ones that are really important, I think, is the number of past messages, context you want it to keep, and you can 
limit that or you can increase that, um, as well as temperature. Temperature is really important too because that tells me how much variability do I want between these responses. So my temperature is lower, I'm going to have more variance in between my responses. My temperature is maximized all the way to the end. You have the consistent of less purpose responses. So you can ask it um, pretty much anything. This is a, a demo I created just for myself to mess around. Basically, I said uh, I want a chatbot I can interact with that can help me come up with uh, what my weekend hiking plan is. So I gave it a type of, uh, I gave it a, a sort of like an input. Um, it says, great. I said I want to take a three to four hour hike. Um, I want it to be somewhere two hours away from the city. Right, okay. So. I was uh, messing around with this earlier today. So if I wait something like 30 seconds, we will give you a response back. Um, the problem that we're having right now is everybody's showing this off, everybody's going in and playing with it, so they're like, okay, the people who are customers don't get access to the product version. So um, let me come back to this in a few minutes here. Show you guys some of the completions as well. Right, so the completions are uh, basically all of the other capabilities that are more like single shot, prompt response type of uh, capabilities that you have. Right? You have, of course, uh, the common ones, which is like generate an email for me, write me a poll, write me a job description, so something creative, something that you come up with on the spot. You have capabilities like summarization of a body of text. Um, the ones that I find are pretty cool is you can get some of these, like, uh, build me a SQL query from natural language, and then uh, in this case, you can see it says, hey, I'm going to build a SQL query, these are the uh, columns that I have, and this is the query output that I wanted. I'm just going to use the, the pre-built example, I think it doesn't pair out with the query Okay, so then it'll build you a SQL query, and it'll give you Prompt back with a response back out. So, and you can take this and then run it. Now, in this playground, these don't go in. Right? So, I generate the SQL query, it doesn't run it instantly. But with a little bit of creativity, I actually have a data science peer who sits in Vancouver. His name is MG. If anybody watches his videos or anything like that, there's an awesome job going into depth here. But he makes this work so that particular natural language prompt, please give me a query or please list the names of departments which employed more than 10 people in the last few months. You can turn it into a code that gets fired against the database and then it returns the response back out. So instead of going to my DDA or my analyst to get a particular data set back out, um, you're able to just write a natural language prompt against relational data. An answer back, which is pretty cool. I wanted to show you guys another uh, example that I thought was quite well. I won't go through the full presentation here just to show this part because it's just a couple of slides. So you guys see that? Okay, perfect. There's a couple uh, Git repos, these are fully deployable, so you can access these Git repos if you deploy this out uh, through like a single click. You can have uh, an Azure environment. So it's pretty quick cool to set up. But this is an example of a use case that we hear over and over and over and over again in conversations. And that is, we have documentation about subject matter X all over the place. It's absolutely spread across shared drives, SharePoint, OneDrive, uh, people's desktops, it's sitting in emails. How do I take all of that information Bring it together so I'm not 
continuously generating documentation fresh and new in a different part of an organization because I didn't know a procedure or a policy or something existed to address it. Right? And so we come up with a way to kind of answer this question. So you can take document information, so PDFs, PDFs with images, with tables, with charts, textual documentation, and you can put it into a knowledge base. The knowledge base indexes that data for you automatically, and then you take it back out, and you put the GPT or ChatGPT front-end base in it, so that individuals can ask it natural questions, like tell me what the HR policy for taking time off is, or tell me what my benefit, benefits package includes, or something like this. So there's two different uh, ways to deploy this. You can either use Azure Native Services, or in this case, this is using open source services. You can deploy that. So you have the option here for both. Let me show you real quick the implemented version. I thought this was pretty cool. So this is just, uh, this is the, the uh, first party version, the Microsoft version of it, so not the open source version. Um, and what it's doing is we basically uploaded the annual report uh, Bob laws and shoppers behind the scene. And so we can ask the questions of uh, the annual report. So um, let's Give a question to see what it says. You should say this is last year's annual report. Right, so I give it a simple generic answer how much money did they make? It says they had a revenue of 56,000 million. I'm getting that wrong. It's like Billion, maybe? Um, can't think right now. But one of the cool things is it'll actually give you the link back to the actual citation where it actually got that information out. So you can verify against this um, that it is in fact 56,000 million in Canadian dollars for 2022. So, um, you put this against other data or other documents, and you need really to kind of retrieve that back out, make the link back to the source where that information was originally created. Um, all of a sudden, you have a really powerful capability for standardizing, for reducing the amount of time and effort it takes organizations to actually find information and provide it to the right people. Uh, we see this being a really, really hot conversation for many finance departments, for so dealing with invoices, payments. Benefits and all this type of stuff, and that data just sits everywhere it's in undiscovered locations all across the organization. I'm going to close this Okay, real quick, um, I think we're going to 7 30. So I have 10 minutes to see if I can get through a very important topic. In I mean, it's fine. Um, responsible AI. I think one of the things that we've all seen is the resignations recently of high-profile individuals, right? The, the Google AI, the Ryan Color AI, um, just resigns and was worried about the piece of development of AI. We had a, a letter signed by something like almost like 30,000 researchers and experts in this field. So slow down AI. I think recently uh, Biden brought Satya Nadella, uh, CEO of Google, as well as you know, like OpenAI for a conversation about what are we doing to make sure that when we develop these technologies, um, they don't run away on us, they don't lose control on us. So the first thing I want to say is this is a evolving space. It is one where we are improving. But it is one that I'm very proud to say um, Microsoft has put a lot of thought and time and energy and effort into trying to make work really well. I've talked to you a bit about how this is actually built baked into our offering as well, so you can see kind of our approach to this. Right? Of course, the principles around responsible AI all have to do with privacy and security, inclusiveness, Accountability, fairness, reliability, and transparency. 
it's of course a multifaceted approach to address this, right? There's accountabilities that we put on the user or the developers of the platform, as well as automations and human interventions that we put on the back end of the tool and the technology. So I think that the piece of development or the need to develop this is uh, one that we're addressing uh, very seriously. So we released, I think a year ago, our responsible AI framework. This is basically a series of principles and guidelines, including like checklists and verification lists that you are developing in the AI solution responsibly, fairly, it's not going to be biased, and there's like a, a, a lot of documentation in these two resources uh, that I encourage you guys to check out whether or not you're using our technology. Right? This is like a big general principle to be aware of uh, what's happening. One of the first conversations that I usually have with an organization looking at implementing AI for their production is I bring in our Canadian responsible AI lead to have a conversation with their CISO and say, this is how we treat your data, this is how we implement guardrails and protections, and this is what you can expect if you leverage the technology that we put in place. So, uh, OpenAI has these same principles built into it. Let me just go through the layers of uh, responsibility. Of course, number one is the purpose of the product. So if anyone's trying to use the Azure version of this, you'll see that you can't just go and deploy it for yourself. Right? You actually have to go through a short application process that says, what are you intending to use this for? So if you're using it for an HR bot, Great, fine, no problem. I guess not yet. Using it to blackmail people, that's not going to go over so well, right? So they're not going to let you build something. Yeah. So that's the, the first thing, right? Understanding that the purpose is a good one, it's meant to improve productivity in our lives, and not meant to charge for it. The second layer is the interface for the prompt, right? So how do we interact with it? Um, where are they interacting with it? Who's interacting with it? Um, how can we control uh, who has access to the bot, who has access to the capabilities that it can bring? Third is filtering, monitoring, and rapid response. I'll go into depth in this one in a second here. And then lastly is the ability to fine tune or customize the model. So I remember I talked about these models being customizable on your data. So you can take GPT-4, for example, and trade it on your report piece of data. And that allows us to limit or constrict the type of responses we can give back as a result. Here are some examples of where we see the responsibility kind of falling. Um, people, process, and technology. There's, of course, the, the design guides, those are the framework that I talked about earlier, right? So we have principles that we put out there that we encourage people to use. Those are the same principles we use to develop our technology internally. So that documentation in that we go is the first layer. There's policies around access, around what we do to resolve abuse, or what we do when we see or detect the abuse of the tools, there's the technical capability like throttling, banning users, uh, filtering, or specific interventions you can have on the behavior of the bot. So you can interject during its reasoning stages as it goes through and asks itself, what do I need to answer the next part of this question? What do I need to do to answer the next part of this question? You can intervene in the middle of that reasoning process behind the scenes to be able to, to change what it sends back out. And then, of course, uh, the customer as well, asking them to be responsible for how they implement it and be responsible for how they control and allow access to it. Really quickly, kind of the flow of how this works. You upload the data, you create a customized model. That's kind of like the first row in the blue box there. You have that customized model, a custom to model. Next thing you do is somebody prompts that, right? That prompt goes in. What happens is there's a detection process in the middle there that happens first. A detection is based off of an ensemble of AI models that says, is there a beast happening here? Um, and then I, I omitted it, but there's like a 
this uh, abuse examples that we look at. And then if it does detect that, or if it detects it over and over and over again, it starts to do some automatic behavior like throttling the responses that the person can get. It can block access automatically to an individual. Um, and it can even stream and shut down the service for the organization altogether if it's a high risk scenario, like a custom based application. If somebody's trying to get it to say, improper uh, things or they have to respond in a proper way. There's an alerting mechanism as well as a 30 day kind of retention of logs, as is typical with a lot of the products. And then at some point, there may or may not be a human intervention to help address what you can cause inside of those companies. If I show that kind of automated box in a little bit more detail here for you guys, basically the customer application which takes intakes and puts out the response in the top left, the responsible AI, an open AI endpoint, that's the API you call, and then the first thing it does is it funnels it through this ensemble model of uh, responsible AI. It looks for things like, is there a section of this content? Is there a hate speech? Is there leaking up personally identifiable information? Is there bias? Is there abuse? Um, all these types of things. So these combination of models come together to create an automated response to say, do we need to do anything to intervene with this particular prompt, this particular user, this particular customer? And then that folds into a broader flow of how it is addressed um, at the service level. The application endpoint, of course, on the left, the automated um, response and alerting system that we just talked about in the middle here, and then the ability for human intervention as well if it gets to an extreme case. So the ability to say, have a, a Microsoft engineer come in and help you look at those logs, so you need to look at those logs and say, what's going on? Why are we getting um, this application shut down all the time? And why is it particular individual who's constantly getting throttled on this application? And then uh, finally, the app sheet, or well, what do we actually do with the family account, family user? Um, there's a whole other two or three layers down that I omitted, but basically, if you take a look at the improvement, the continuous improvement path there, that leads down into a whole other chain of actions that we do, like updating our policies and procedures, updating our automatic detection system, updating education of the customer say this is what's happening, this is how we can correct or uh, intervene with this resources. Okay, I think I've run out of time here, but happy to share the deck out um, for some of the other interesting topics that I didn't get to cover here. Uh, but I think one of the things that will be very interesting um, is where prompt engineering it's, I think, starting to emerge where people are posting jobs for individuals who know how to prompt engineer um, the open AI region of the AI. So I'll, I'll leave you guys with this is just one little slide here. These are kind of like the high level ways, the broad categories of how you can do prompt engineering. I won't go through them right now, but these are these are kind of like the five pillars of how you can address prompt engineering. So, Useful if you are looking at deploying these technologies or if you're getting funny responses back from the technologies. All right, thank you.